Okay. Start. Okay. Yes. So, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank Vasu Hospital and the marketing team to give me this opportunity to talk on this topic. Today's topic of discussion is hand injuries. An overview of a hand injury. Why is it important? How do we have to manage? Uh, what is the importance of this talk? So, is it really important to discuss about hand injuries? So, many of the people come back with hand injuries and the most of them lie in low socioeconomic status. So, the treatment usually is not given properly. Most of them have a lot of misconceptions. For example, if there is any finger injury, does it grow back? If there is an amputation, they feel it is a lizard tail and it might grow back. So there are a lot of misconceptions and a lot of uh, inadequate treatment as well as um, improper treatment which is taken care in our fraternity. So the whole talk of this whole uh, idea of this talk is to make you realize that how important the hand injuries are and uh, how can we treat it differently so that you have a best outcome. So. As you can see this uh, pie chart, the body part affected in our body. So majority is a finger injuries, 64.8%. If you include hand, hand and the arm, that is 7.8%. So it consists of the majority of injury where a person can come across. So you can't neglect this kind of injuries where uh, it is consists almost more than 80% of the injuries. Are. These are all trivial injuries, but can give rise to a lot of problems. So, what is the importance of hand? Hand is not just an organ or a part, body part, but it is also used for several other activities. So, it's used as a communication tool. It's a very sensitive uh, structure. So, you can see in, during your uh, undergraduation days where we can see that the two-point discrimination is done on the fingertips as well as in the lips and tongue. That says that a finger is a very, very sensitive area and it is used for multiple purposes employment most of the employment in nowadays involve your hand it's very necessary for an independent living without a proper functional hand independent living is almost inexistible so we used hand for communication like in greetings it's a warm way of welcoming shaking a hand giving a hug so everything is actually a function of a hand the gestures sometimes give a different meaning. There are different languages which are used with use of a hand, a sign languages. There is a totally different language where the people who are deaf and dumb can communicate with other people. As you can see, this diagram would actually be familiar with in Genong and Guyton textbooks where our uh, representation of the sensations of different parts of the body. So this man, with a big head and big hand says that hands are really a highly sensitive organ. So uh, having a very, very normal, sensitive and functional hand is essential for normal functioning. Relationships and use of hands is fundamental to most of our vocations. Without hand, it's almost impossible to do all these tasks. And without use of a hand, most people would find it independent, difficult, very, very impossible. And the other implications of this kind of injuries are, see, this is a simple fracture, a fracture of the shaft of metacarpals, very simple ones, can be treated conservatively as well as operative. But you look at the implication of this in the society. So the person can't work for two months. So how would your finances scope if the hand is not working for two months? So it's, it's, it definitely puts a lot of financial strain on the family as well as a society. So my topic of discussion will be going on these headings. So uh, normally with an introduction, approach to hand trauma patients and the structural injury starts with the cutaneous injuries. A very few pointers on tendon injuries, nerve and bone injuries. And how do we deal with amputation and reimplantations of the hand and fingers? So you know that now understand that hand is a very vital part of the body. So without that, it's almost like the person is uh, very, very difficult to manage. Uh, the four requirements of a functional hand is one, it should move with ease. So there should not be any stiffness 
or any kind of restriction towards the movement or any kind of weakness. So it should move with these. It should be sensitive. So if there is no sensation, there is very high chances that you might actually injure it. So putting it in warm water or some insect bite you won't notice or infection, you might not have any sensations at all. It should be pain free. To give an example, just a simple subungal neuroma, a neuroma which is underneath your nail can cause a lot of pain, especially doing simple activities like trying to pinch or comb your hair. So it should be coordinated in the sense if there is any nerve disturbances, your hand movements are not coordinated. So in such conditions, your hand is as uh, ineffective as it's not there. It accounts to almost 5 to 10% of hospital ER visits. Quite a high number. 10% of hospital visits is with this simple finger and hand injuries. It's a great potential for serious handicap. So it's always been neglected that this is a simple small injury. It's a small cut. So it means that it has to be neglected. No, it's not. But it leaves a lot of serious handicap because patients usually come to me after some complication has been developed, which is extremely difficult for me to treat. And you need a very good understanding of anatomy because the hand anatomy is totally different than the other anatomy because it's a lot of structures are pushed into single small compartment there. should understand how our hand functions compared to all other areas. A good physical examination skills and knowledge of indication and treatment is very, very essential in treating. So at the end of this talk, you will be at least uh, easy enough to understand in what line the treatment has to go. So proper initial diagnosis and timely treatment is very, very important. And how is it different from treating any other orthopedic injuries? I'll let you know. So as any other uh, orthopedic injuries, the first most important part of the examination is the history. If the patient gives you a history, proper history. Sometimes the patient comes with a small puncture wound in the palm. So if you don't ask proper history, so you will, might miss it some deeper injuries. It could be a penetrating injury causing a lot of trauma underneath that. Physical examination. So one should have a proper thorough physical examination of cutaneous structures, tendons, nerve, neurovascular examinations. And imaging involves X-ray, ultrasound, MRI as any other structures. But to be specifically give you an idea, ultrasound, which has a very, very small probe, which actually can be put on the finger and try to diagnose the tendon injuries or nerve neurovascular bundle injuries. So these kind of probes, we have it in our hospital where our radiologist uh, are trained to do this kind of ultrasound, a musculoskeletal ultrasound or this, so where they can diagnose it in a very near perfection. So we don't need an MRI to diagnose this kind of tendon injury. A good ultrasound with the experienced radiologist is more than enough. So these kind of ultrasound probes are very, very essential when you're managing the uh, hand injuries. So starting with the cutaneous injuries, which is extremely common, I'm 100% sure you would have come across during your practice, as well as during uh, your own uh, family, friends, and everybody will have some kind of injuries, especially in this. It could be a small cut, starts with a small cut, go on to become an amputation. We don't know. Okay. So to differentiate uh, what are the different structures in the cutaneous area, the dorsum and the palmar skin is totally different. So the dorsum skin is something like your husband. They are thin and pliable, attached to a hand skeleton only by a loose areolar tissue where lymphatics and veins course. Loose attachment makes it more vulnerable to degloving injuries. Any injuries, the dorsum of the skin gets degloved. It's very skin, it's very loose. It's attached only with the thin areolar tissue. But on the contrary, the skin on the palmar surface is like your wife. It's like a thick and glabrous and not as pliable on dorsal skin. I'm sorry uh, if I'm being very sexist, but basically uh, I mean to say that wives are a little more grounded and more committed to the family. So strongly attached to the underlying fascia by numerous vertical fibers most firmly anchored to the deep structure on the palmar's creases and there's a high content of sensory nerve endings which has actually which very essential for the normal functioning so the dorsum of the skin is not as sensitive as the palmar skin so this difference you should keep it in mind especially when you're treating cutaneous injuries so there are two types one is a simple closed one which involves contusion and hematomas whenever you get hit there might be a swelling swelling compared to all other areas in the fingers, especially in the tip, is, is, it's a little more complicated. The reason behind that is it can go in for something called as compartment syndrome. Just like in the forearm, 
the finger also can go in for compartment syndrome where there are tight septes in between which causes a tight uh, in, in uh, interference with the vasculature so which might lead to tip gangrenous changes so whenever there is a injury like a blunt injury to the finger the finger getting jammed between the fingers but there is no cut but even those injuries are a bit serious the reason behind that is they can go in for potentially they can go in for compartment syndrome the other open injuries like incised lacerated punctured penetrated and abrasions and degloving injuries they vary in depth from superficial to deep and depending on that we have to explore the underlying structures for the injuries so the typical culprits of these kind of injuries you already know a chainsaw especially all these are people who are using hardware like these and uh, angle grinders a broken glasses very very common one kitchen knives and so for some reason people who try to cut the avocado or scoop the avocado will have a lot of finger injuries have come across quite frequently in our and the results common results are these that there could be a vertical split splitting the nail nail bed as well as the skin on the dorsum this is simplest injury all it requires is a repair of the nail bed and putting nail back in the position a nail stabilization and a suturing sometimes the skin might be a loss but very minor so these kind of heal with the secondary intention we just leave it sometimes the skin loss is a little more even these injuries are not very serious they heal by themselves all it requires is a simple dressing sometimes it could be a small simple amputation so uh, depend this these treatment depends on the finger which are injured important fingers we do try to make sure that you get back the skin by local flaps or in case if it is a little finger and not a very dominant hand we tend to we leave it by a secondary intention sometimes the injury is more than what it is visible there could be a fracture underneath as well as there could be a tendon and a neurovascular injuries these are much high violent injuries wherein there are structures to more than one there could be simple cutaneous to deep to as well as vascular bone as well as neurovascular structures these kind of injuries looks very innocuous it just looks like a small wound which needs to be just uh, not even a dressing but these are puncture wounds when there are puncture wounds which go through and through there will be lot of injuries inside the structure there could be an injury to the palmar arch the ponyrosis the plantar uh, palmar ponyrosis neurovascular structures tendons so there might be an injury to more than one structure so to coming to the management of these kind of injuries degloving punch bite so the small injuries uh, people already know the awareness is in the common public all it requires is a rinse and cover but when it comes to large area so giving a wash to those these kind of wounds is very very essential and in the hand because it's very sensitive organ we tend to give a local infiltration try to numb that area so that your wash is much more effective by giving a lignocaine the patient is going to cooperate with you for a little longer time so that you can irrigate it profusely for a period of time so that all the foreign body underlying structures everything is cleared off very well so this is almost like 90% of the treatment rest is taken care by simple closure or it can be closed on a delayed basis if the wound is very very contaminated say wound is older than 6 to 8 hours in that cases we tend to not primarily close it we just wait till it everything gets clean and then close it on a secondary intention so probably a delayed primary closure after 4 days or sometimes 5 days is essential so bites we don't close especially human and animal bites we tend to give prophylaxis antibiotic prophylaxis and immunoglobulins whichever is necessary as the as to what bite is contusions is mainly cold packs limb elevation is the crucial part of the treatment especially you can limb elevate with the help of something called as a pillow cover sling a little above the level of the heart cold packs yes definitely and uh, we do not bandage or try to put some tight crepe bandages on the contusion because they might be very very painful and might cause go into something called compartment syndrome fingertip amputations is another uh, commonly seen uh, injuries uh, in our opds so it can injure only the skin or it can involve bone with the nail nail bed tendon and the pulp and the padded area of the fingertips so irrespective of it the ultimate goal of the treatment should be to give him back what it was so this is one of the procedures what we do for the fingertip amputation so healing with secondary intention of these kind of total amputation at the tip gives rise to very very bad quality of the skin the skin is so thin that wherever you touch you try to use the phone or trying to 
hold something which is a little hard, the skin breaks and starts bleeding. So to prevent that, we do something called as a V-viplasty. So we cut the skin in this fashion, like a V, and then try to pull the skin and then cover it on that area. And this V becomes Y. So this is called as a V-viplasty. It's a very, very commonly done procedures in our OPDs. We usually don't take them to operation theaters. We do it in either minor OT or in the OPD procedures or in the emergency room as well. So large defects, sometimes the skin defects are not enough to be closed with this kind of local flaps. In those cases, we tend to use a little thicker graft from different areas or a local one. This is called a local flaps where we use a rhomboid limber flaps to rotate it and put it on that area. The other one is called as a local rotation flap starting from the wrist because the dorsum of the skin on the wrist is quite loose. That skin can be closed and some skin can be taken rotated over the draw area. This is a VY advancement flap surgeries, very similar to what I'd explained before. But to cover a little bigger skin, what we can do is flex the distal phalanx so that the area is little less to cover. This is called as a modification of a VY plasty where there are two flaps which are raised from the sides. So one flap from the radial aspect, another flap from the uh, ulnar aspect. So both this flap come and join in the middle, covering the distal tip. So when the area is a little greater than uh, one third of the volar tissue, where there are local flap can't cover these kind of injuries, what we do is we take a flap from the dorsum of the skin, which is called as a cross finger flap. So we take the skin on the dorsum and then try to cover it on the volar aspect because volar skin is the priority. So dorsal skin can be taken out and put it on the volar aspect. Now this raw area is covered with something called as a skin graft, split skin grafting. At the end of three weeks, we split the skin and this skin gets attached to the raw area. Sometimes this can't actually cover the largest area. In those conditions, we take only the subcutaneous tissue and cover it up with a skin graft in both the areas, which is called as a reverse cross finger flap. Thinar flap is another thing which we don't usually recommend. The reason behind that is the thinar flap is where the flap is elevated on this area where the skin is a little loose. This is a glabrous skin. So the number amount of skin which we can actually harvest is very less. One second thing is once that heals, the skin is taken and it heals on the skin. The finger which is on the donor area heals well. But the skin on the donor area, the, the recipient area heals well. But in the donor area, the, it becomes a scar. So every most of the function which involves gripping of the things, like gripping. So this scar comes in the way and gives a little pain. So in that reason, so we didn't tend uh, tendencies to avoid these kind of thinner flaps, which we used to do it very frequently prior to. Annular flap, where we can actually take the circumferential flap from the one area and then try to advance it and then try to close the tip, and the rest of the area is covered with the skin grafting. This is a homo digital bipedal island advancement flap where we can part of the skin can be advanced from thumb and then put it on the distal area and the remaining area can be do with the skin grafting. So these are all microvascular uh, repairs wherein we use our loops as well as microscope to have a magnification so that we can dissect out the vessel very neatly and then try to advance the flap so that we can cover it at a better place. And the traction on the vessels should not be there. If there are any traction, it can go in for necrosis of the flap and causing amputation of the thumb. So thumb is always a given first priority. Index is the next. Middle finger followed by ring and little finger. So the repair of the thumb is have to be, we have to maintain the length as much as possible. Reverse vascular pedicle graft where we actually take a vascular island from the middle part of the phalanx and then try to rotate it and put it on the deep. This is only when the skin is not good for the local flaps. When the, uh, the local area is really large, so the local flaps are a little difficult, so we do something called as a reverse radial artery flap, where the skin on the radial artery, which is based for the radial artery, is taken and rotated and put over the raw area. So these kind of uh, extensive repairs leaves a lot of scars, but our aim is to aim for a functional recovery more than the cosmetic one. So dorsal ulnar artery flap is another thing which is actually used to cover the ulnar aspect of the palm. Posterior interosseous forearm flap, again this is a distant flap but it is the same vascular pedicle which has been uh, transferred through the tunnel and closed it back. Again this is mainly used for the ulnar aspect of the palm if there is a pain. 
So distant flaps are basically uh, two. One, what we use regularly is the submammary flaps. Raise the skin on the mammary area, put the skin to cover it up, wait for three weeks. After three weeks, divide the flap and this uh, donor and recipient area heals very well. The other thing is a groin flap where we take a part of the skin on the groin, cover it on the raw area, especially when there is a circumferential skin loss. So there is something called STG, STSG. Basically, these are uh, commercially available acellular dermis derived from the human skin. Uh, the usage is very, very minimal because of uh, rejection and some kind of reactions. So alloderm right now is not a very regularly used uh, uh, product. So, but uh, for extensive cases where we can't take the distant flap as well as your local flaps, in those conditions, we use alloderms. So just brief uh, introduction to tendon injuries. Tendon injuries can go in for acute and chronic. So one should know examination of the tendons like FDP, FDS, as well as your lumbrical positions, introsius. So we should know exactly thorough idea of what function is for each muscle. So how to identify the tendon injuries. So for our convenience, we have divided into different zones, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, because of which it's easy for us to uh, communicate with our peers that these are the zone of injuries and uh, this is what the managements are. So extensor injuries and the flexor injuries. So each area is being named differently for uh, different. So if there is any zone uh, one injuries and the extensor tendon which is called as a mallet finger. So the finger goes in for flexion of the DIP because the long extensor is cut. So the management is to put a splint in extension of DIP joint and a little flexion of the IP joint. So in, if this is the position which is maintained, so it heals well. Sometimes the, it, it is, uh, sometimes there is a bony avulsion. In those conditions, we tend to operate. So to make you understand, this is a simple splint which we had put. This is called as a stack splint. Idea is to maintain the extension of DIP and flexion of PIP joint. This is good enough for uh, most of the uh, malletic finger injury. So depending on other injuries like uh, central slip, if it is cut, it is called as a botanist deformity. And there might be something called as a fixed flexion MCP if there is a zone 5 injuries. So each zone presents us to with the classical deformities. So zone 1, it is a mallet finger injury. Zone 3, where the central slip of the tendons, where it is attached to the base of the middle phalanx is cut, that gives rise to botanist deformity. Botanist deformity is flexion of the IP joint and extension of your distal phalanx. So this is the deformity which causes because of zone three injury. Zone five is just the finger drop. It's called as a finger drop. Just like foot drop, there is a finger drop. So flexion at the MCP joint. So coming to the flexor tendon, which is even more challenging to treat, the reason behind that is they go through a very, very close compartments. So they pass through a narrow pulleys and come and gets attached in a different little complicated area. Zone 2 injuries are always very, very, very difficult to treat and difficult to rehab. The reason behind that is they retract into the palm one. Retrieving the tendon becomes difficult. Second thing is there are three tendons at that area. Two slips of FDS and one slip of FDP. Because of which if there is cut, repair becomes a little bulky. Because of which they don't glide into the tendon sheets or they don't glide into the pulleys. There's a lot of pulley system inside. So these are the different pulleys what we have. So zone 1, 2, 3, 4. Each pulley has to be repaired or at least uh, reconstructed if it is not repaired. So this is uh, something called a flexor tendon injury at zone 1, which is known as a jersey finger. Say when per some person is running and the person behind him actually holds a jersey or uh, some cloth, the finger which is flexed suddenly gets extended because of which the distal phalanx base where the FTP is gone and attached gets pulled out because of which there is absence of flexion of this finger. So this can be repaired immediately on an emergency basis and then try to immobilize and so that the tendon heals and put for rehab. These are the zone 2 injuries where there are multiple cut injuries. The prognosis of these kind of zone 2 injuries are very, very bad. So until unless you have a very good person who is actually uh, doing a rehab, very difficult for the normal function to resume. So that's why the zone 2 is known as no man's land because loss of active flexion at the MCP joint happens. So post repair or reconstruction of these tendons, we put them into splint, which is called as a dynamic splint, wherein the patient's 
try to move the fingers okay actively and then there is a passive extension so these are the different ways of going about rehab is again a totally different ball game in this kind of hand injuries unlike other joints we tend to start rehab very very quickly within 2 to 3 weeks we have to start gamekeeper's thumb is another commonly uh, encountered uh, injuries whenever the thumb goes in for ulnar deviation there is a small tendon which is called as a ulnar collateral ligament which tears and gets hidden inside so the healing becomes difficult in those cases instead of treating just like a sprain this has to be immobilized with a thumb spica splint at least for 3 to 4 weeks the chances of healing is better and uh, most of the time if it fails you'll have to go for a surgical repair of this ulnar collateral ligament injuries just a brief note on nerve injuries like uh, there are three important nerves in the hand median ulnar and radial nerve you know the distribution and the injuries can be leading from neuropraxia axonotomesis and neurotomesis and each person should know how to examine the sensory and the motor part of these kind of nerves so once it is there that the, the repair happens repair can be done either by neurolysis sometimes there is a nerve injury in the nerve is in continuity but there will be lot of scarring around that area so what we do is we go and release all the scars which is called as a neurolysis so once the scar is released so nerve will start recovering and give rise to sensation as well as the motor repair neurorophy is end to end nerve repair wherein we try to do a epineurorophy wherein the epineurium is repaired using a loops and very very small sutures like 10 0 or 8 0 sutures and uh, this is a kind of epineural or group fascicular neurorophy which we do and uh, the other thing is if there is area where the nerve loss is there the segment of nerve is absent we do something called as autologous nerve grafting the nerve grafting is taken either by the sural nerve or sometimes with the uh, superficial radial nerve so epineural neurorophy and group fascicular neurorophy is a different ways of the bone injuries the one important point is the scaphoid you know the scaphoid gives rise to lot of problems because of non union chances because of loss of vascularity so we tend to treat it with a scaphoid cast 3 to 4 months followed by in case if there is any failure we can go for surgery so these are called a halberd screws which are used which can be buried inside and treated and uh, the my work mentioning is a bennett's fracture and a rolandas fracture bennett's is basically a small part of the bone articular surface which is still attached to the articular surface and rest of the bone is pulled out so that's the reason there is a dislocation of the joint so there is a abductor pollicis longus muscle which is attached to the base of this finger which pulls it so that there is a displacement so the idea is to put it back into the position and put k wires to the transarticular joint so that it doesn't get displaced the difference between bennett's and rolandos is rolandos becomes like a base like a v y fractures where there is one fragment on the medial lateral and there is a disconnection between the shaft so the difference between the two is the bennett's fracture the treatment usually is a little simpler option where we put a transarticular kevr and the reduction is achieved rolandos there should be a reconstruction of the articular surface this is how we do a fixation of a bennett's fracture the one wire goes across the joint the other wire crossing the metacarpals so this is indirect way of treating it so direct way of treating it is uh, through using a just applications or using a plate with the clamps phalanx fracture distal phalanx usually no more than 90% of the time we don't operate for the distal phalanx stuff fractures shaft as well for the base if there is associated with the jersey or a mallet finger we have to fix it back middle phalanx again if it is displaced uh, most of the fractures are treated conservatively if it is displaced have to be treated with the k wire proximal phalanx the principle is same so these kind of fractures like distal phalanx we don't treat them operatively conservative treatment is good enough middle phalanx shaft uh, most of the time is conservative but in case if there is displacement it requires a small kevr fixation in the same similar cases so just a few note on amputation and reimplantation so people come with this kind of amputation where the thumb and the index finger which is the most important part of the hand is amputated so to give you an idea how to send these kind of patients to a referral centers especially on the patient you are referring to me with this kind of amputation their patients will have the amputated limbs so how do we send that so what we do is we take a container at preferably a sterile container if not available at least a container so make sure that it is clean uh, you have to make sure that the amputated part is nicely cleaned with saline and 
dab it with a clean gauze. Make sure that there is no moisture content in there. So you wrap a amputated limb with a dry gauze, not a wet gauze, dry gauze, put it in a container and this container has to be kept in a ice box. So I should not come in direct contact with the amputated limb. Okay. This is very, very essential. So whenever you're sending an amputated limb to a referral centers, higher centers, make sure that this is a procedure. So ice or the water should not come in direct contact with the finger. So the recommended ischemic time for reliable success is if the patient's fingers are sent, it tolerates ischemia better than the hand. The reason is there are a lot of muscles in the hand which are not very, very uh, good for ischemia. So if it is only fingers, digits, 12 hours for warm ischemia, say that we are not stored it properly in ice box, we can wait up to 12 hours for the re-implantation. But if it is in cold, we can wait up to 24 hours till all the patient's workup is done. But in case of hand amputation, 6 hours for warm and 12 hours for cold ischemia. So this is very, very essential. So time is money here. So every time you try to delay, the patient spends more money and more hospital hospitalization. So these are different types of amputations which we reattached and the functional uh, recovery of these kind of re-implantation is roughly about 70-80% provided the patient cooperates very well. There are guillotine amputation where the amputation completely is at one level. The recovery of these kind of guillotine amputations are really, really great than the crush injuries. So I really thank you for patient listening. So I think I made few points very clear as to which is could be helpful for your practice. Uh, any doubts, any questions are welcome. Any kind of clarification with relation to hand and uh, finger injuries or anything related to upper injuries or other orthopedic issues. I'm free for the questions and discussions. You can post it in the group and then um, really thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Yes, sir. I can hear you. F one FP. The question is, uh, what is the role of K-wire uh, in case of uh, this kind of injuries? K-wire is like a workhorse in kind of uh, finger and uh, hand injuries. Without K-wire, we don't take up any kind of bone injuries. Uh, there is a book written by someone called as Dr. Rex, who's a orthopedic surgeon in Coimbatore. He's written a wonderful book, which is uh, one of the kind in the whole world. Nobody has written a book on K-wires. So he has written something called as the safe corridors in the hands. So you can actually uh, point out where we can insert the K-wires in the fingers because there are a lot of important structures. So you can actually go through the tendon, through the vein, through the arteries. So they have actually charted out a lot of safe corridors which can actually be used to put the K-wires. And the majority of the time, the hand injuries are always treated with K-wires. Only few exceptional cases are with ex uh, just external apl applicators. Other than that, uh, I think uh, they use plates, mini plates, like 1.3 and 1.4 plates, only for a very complicated cases. 
post surgery the other question is asked by uh, dr sai farooq is uh, doc post surgery do they lead to contractures 100% if we don't uh, start moving them so idea of treating uh, hand injuries are fix them and move them as early as possible as early as 2 weeks so you don't uh, really wait for the fracture to heal but the fixation should be so that at least there will be movement so there are something called as dynamic external fixators wherein you can move your fingers but still the fracture is held in position so these are different ways of treating a fracture in the fingers wherein the joint is still moved so that the, the, to avoid the contractures in the joints more than the contractures the, we have the tendon shortening collateral ligaments contractures and intraarticular adhesions which causes lot of stiffness in the fingers so the dip is for more prone for stiffness and the other point which i would like to add is so the hand is always immobilized in something called as a functional position so we always talk about functional position in the sense there is a 90 to at least 80 degrees of flexion of mcp joint a little bit extension of the wrist joint if we immobilize in this function so the gaining back the movements is much much easier the reason behind that is in this moment the collateral ligaments are stretched maximum especially of mcp joint the collateral ligaments are stretched maximally if you immobilize in this position or more flexion the collateral ligaments are actually shorter because of which the contracture becomes a little more stronger so it's very difficult to get back that so they lead to something called extensor lag or difficulty in flexing completely so this terminal flexion is lost if you don't immobilize so immobilization of the hand is always in a functional position wherein the wrist is extended about 10 to 15 degrees the mcp joints are all in at least 90 degrees of flexion at least and then the thumb is always left free if the thumb immobilization is always taken care in case of neutral position in the case that the thumb spica the splint is kept in a neutral position with distal phalanx bent at least to 10 to 15 degrees this is the normal way of trying to treat the next question is how a physio will help a role in rehab of hand injuries what is the percentage of complete recovery this question was asked by chandrapriya rehab is the most important part of our treatment so most of the hand injuries rehab is done by me so because uh, the training somebody for a rehab for a hand is extremely difficult so we expect something and they do something so most of the rehab is done by me i call them in the opds mobilize the distal phalanx by myself giving some local anesthesia wax bath everything is done by me complete recovery is there provided it's done properly so depends on injury to injury very bad extremely complicated injuries uh, the expectations of the patients are always high but we have to make them realize that you might not completely recover and these are the realistic expectations for simple injuries sometimes if the patient doesn't do rehab well that's when the problem happens so those are the patients who needs to be taken care for rehab so rehab is extremely important and send them as early as possible then the next question asked by priyanka danda is uh, is there any contraindications uh, for skin grafting skin grafting is uh, regularly used in case of dorsal skin losses the skin loss on the dorsum can be uh, used a split skin thin grafting wherein a thin layer of skin is taken and put on the dorsum this take this is taken care the skin loss on the dorsum is taken care very well but on the palmar aspect this skin will not stay there uh even if it is stays and heals the skin breakage and uh, bleeding extremely difficult so in such conditions we tend to put lot of local flaps distant flaps are much much better than the skin grafting so i think i've answered your questions i think subsequently i'll tell you more details about it the next question uh, is by sumin subedi sir your question is what is the extent of recovery in zone 2 injuries how much of functions can be achieved uh it this the zone 2 injuries even for the most experienced surgeon poses lot of challenges especially if there are multiple tendons which are cut so the repair should be so meticulous that there not be any bump at all so the meticulous repair is the key for the most important part in the zone 2 injuries the other thing which is more important is preservation of pulleys if the pulleys are nicely preserved your function becomes really easy 
third most important part is once the repair is done the movement should be as early as possible so even if you leave it for a week these tendons will start getting adherent to the underlying pulley because you have gone and exposed these areas so the zone 2 injuries always poses a challenge even even today till date i am little stress if i'm doing a zone 2 injuries it's not because i don't have confidence in my surgery but there are a lot of other variables which are involved in uh, having a successful uh, functions reason behind that is patient rehab and his follow up so everything depends on that so i would like to really counsel the patient that if he is coming for follow up regularly then only i am trying to do zone 2 injuries otherwise just operating and send them back to their home or go somewhere else or different places it's very very difficult welcome sir the other question which was asked was uh, again sending a amputated limb so i think i've already explained it to you in the presentation if you're not uh, heard the presentation cleaning that properly uh, no need of any antiseptic solutions you just have to clean it with a normal saline wrap it up with a dry gauze not the wet gauze put it in a sterile container nicely cap it so that there no air goes into that that has to be kept in a ice box or a bag which is surrounded by the ice so make sure that there is no moisture or direct ice in contact with the injury because of this what happens there will be shortening of the skin edges in case if there is any moisture there will be lot of shortening around the skin because of which the repair becomes very difficult and if there is any contact with the ice there will be something called as cold burns so the skin would have got devitalized because of the cold exposure so again the necrosis is quite fast so in case of these kind of cases we don't recommend a uh, reimplantation because the results are extremely bad Uh, one more interesting question, which is uh, the question is, uh, what if the patient develops deformity and presents you late? It's a very good question. Most of our patients uh, tend to neglect these kind of hand injuries. They feel that uh, it's a very trivial and minor injury. They tend to neglect it. So normally they come when the all complications have been developed. so treating these kind of complications poses even more uh, tougher challenge on hand surgeon so what we tend to do is uh, first uh, is to get back all the passive movements so the finger is stiff okay and get back the passive movements try to move passively so that the joints will start getting at least flexible so that once we operate immobilize and start mobilizing it's easier on them so first initially try to recover conservatively as much as possible the contractures and stiffness over that once we start operating again it will go in for stiffness then recovering that is it's easy already a stiff finger we open everything is a scar we won't be able to see anything at all so idea is to make sure that your surgical planes are little easier by moving the fingers doing some physiotherapy make it supple and then go in for surgery <laughs> if uh, there are no other questions i think uh, we're going to conclude the session if anything any other uh, clarification or any other one more message is there any other clarification my number uh, is in the group you can contact me for any clarifications or any referrals any kind of help with in which involves upper limb trauma uh, generally uh, yeah actually that was starting with and till the clavicle like okay. so any kind of clarification in these aspects uh, oh. to help you out okay thank you thank you